All right, so I'm uh, Michelle Johnson. I'm going to talk about the dontoid fractures. I uh, walked across the street uh, before this course. I live right here. Sadly, I have nothing to disclose. My, uh, I'm going to talk about the dontoid fractures. Go over some quick overview and then some cases. It's about 10 to 15 percent of cervical fractures. They are usually not fatal, but if they are, they're usually at the time of injury, and only about 10 percent have significant deficits. Usually associated with neck pain, worse with movement. Uh, Bimodal, it's either young patients or old patients. Young patients tend to have high velocity injuries. Older patients, very low energy trauma, like a ground level fall. And uh, in the studies I read, 70 was considered old. Workup includes your normal x-ray, CT, MRIs. Um, at our hospital, we no longer get x-rays. There's a trauma protocol, and they go straight to CT. They kind of CT from head to toe, but a lot of our community hospitals still do get x-rays, so sometimes you will see x-rays. Patient factors to consider when you're seeing the patient. Age is actually a very uh, big one. Associated injuries, medical comorbidities, healing potential, tolerance for treatment. Um, you know, older patients definitely do not tolerate halos, and patient wishes. So two mechanisms of injury. One is hyperflexion, which is the most common, which is, your, of course, your head leaning forward, as this fracture here shows how that would occur. Second is hyperextension, which is less common. Classification, which we all know, are uh, Anderson and D'Alonzo classification. Type 1, which is right here, is at the tip of the dens. It is considered a type 1 fracture if it is above the transverse ligament. Um, sometimes there's a bulging of the alar ligament. You have to be very careful with these fractures. It does indicate something like an AOD, which we just talked about, that you have to look for. Type 2, which is much, much more common, is uh, right at the base. And again, this is a, a watershed blood supply area. The apex is from branches of the ICA, and the base is from branches of the vertebral artery. So this is not only does not have a lot of surface area for contact for healing, but also has decreased blood supply as well. And then type 3, which is through the body. So moving on to type 1, there isn't much controversy on how to treat a type 1. Um, again, you worry about an AOD or transverse ligament injury when you do see these. We usually immobilize them anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks. And recommendations are either collar or halo. We tend to use a collar uh, more often, and there's near 100% fusion with these. And this is a CT scan. I, I've seen, I think I've been here six years. We see a lot of trauma, and I've seen one type 1. They're really not that common. Ways to immobilize the uh, cervical spine. We all know the halo, which most patients do not like, nor do they like the Minerva brace or the CTO brace. We have our Philly collar, Miami J, and Aspen collar, which they seem to tolerate a little better when you talk about cervical immobilization. So moving on to type 2. Type 2 remains controversial. There's a lot of papers about type 2 depending on age and mechanism of injury and how we treat these. Um, there's a wide range of non-union rates, depending on what paper you read, anywhere from 5 to 76 percent. The overall quoted rate is about 30 percent. It does depend on certain factors, such as displacement. The bigger the displacement, such as greater than 6 millimeters, you have a higher non-union rate, closer to 70 percent. The most recent papers and recommendations use advanced age as age older than 50. Um, most people wouldn't consider that old, but in this paper it was. You have uh, increased non-union rates, 21 times higher than those uh, with similar fractures who were younger. The other controversy with the type 2 is a bony union versus a stable fibrous union. And this mostly occurs in the elderly population. So the union rates are based off of bony fusion. But there are a lot of people, such as myself, who believe as you get older, you can actually have a stable fibrous non-union in the elderly, where the fibrous tissue holds the fracture together, even though it doesn't seem to be a, a complete bony fusion. Um, the reason that we tolerate that sometimes in our older patients, because delayed uh, myelopathy, which is what we worry about if these fractures don't heal, takes 13 years or, or, or longer, and that's usually in younger patients. And these older patients here are 80, 85, 90, they're probably not going to be around 13 years. So non-union risk factors. Again, age greater than 50, more than 5 millimeters of displacement, fracture uh, comminution, or an angulated fracture of more than 10 degrees, or delay in treatment, meaning that they show up three to six months after the injury and don't realize it's there. So treatment options for type 2. We have immobilization, which we showed before. They're a halo or collar. 
odontoid screw um, that does assume that the transverse ligament is intact in order to do an odontoid screw. Both of those are, are motion uh, preserving mm -hmm. options. And then the posterior C12 fusions. I have a few pictures, but I think uh, Praveen's talking about this afterwards. C12 wiring, which we've already seen, transarticular screws, which we just saw, and a harms construct C12 fusion, uh, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more in depth next. You do remember that when you fuse C12, you lose 50 of your 100 degrees of rotation, so about 50%. So we'll kind of go through these. Um, odontoid screw. So something we do not too often, we may do 18 to 20 of these a year, mostly in our elderly population at our institution. It is, uh, takes more time to set up than it does to actually do. Either use biplanar floral or we have an O-arm that we can just use biplanar floral on. Uh, depends on patient morphology. It's an ACDF approach. It's a simple screw that goes right through the fracture site all the way to the end. There was a controversy at one time of one versus two screws. Um, one is just as biomechanically stable as two and a little bit easier to put in just one screw. About a 90% fusion rate, and that is if this is done within the first six months of a fracture. Um, some people say earlier than that, but that's what most of the papers say. Very high risk of non-union if you have this type of a fracture. It's difficult to line this back up and get a screw where you need to, so you may either miss when you go across the fracture line um, or it just doesn't heal as well. So here I have a 69 year old who had a four foot fall, which isn't very far, I think it was a, sh a short ladder, and we have a type two odontoid fracture here. So given the age that we talked about, he's a little older than 50 years old, so he has a very high non-union rate, we opted to put in the odontoid screw in him, and he did very well. This is our 71-year-old with a ground level fall. Again, has a type 2 fracture. This one is posteriorly placed. MRI was done in this patient, which we normally do MRIs if we're going to consider surgery, looking for transverse ligament injury, or if they have either difficult exam or we don't have a good exam. We do not get MRIs on every odontoid fracture that we see. This particular patient here, um, before they were discharged from the hospital, we do get an upright x-ray of them in their collar. This is the x-ray of the patient, and you'll see here is the base of the dens, and over here is the top of the dens. So this occurred uh, three days after being in the hospital in a collar. So obviously this is not something we can send this patient home with. So what would you do? Our options are either um, do nothing or, or do something. We at our institution try not to put a 71-year-old in, in a halo. They, the reports are up to 86% uh, morbidity mortality for people over the age of 74 in a halo for various reasons. I mean, it's very, very high. There might be very, I don't know, I don't know any case that you would, you would stick an, an elderly person um, in a halo more than maybe just a day or two if you're trying to reduce something and hold them in place before you fix them possibly even then it's, it's a high risk for aspiration pneumonia and, and other things to happen in the hospital but um, I would try not to put a halo on anyone this age but we uh, we thought that the patient would make it through surgery so we were able to reduce it and uh, we, we put an odontoid screw in now, odontoid screws in the elderly, there's a lot of papers on this too, also have up to, I think, 26, 28 uh, percent mortality morbidity associated with a surgical procedure as well. Yes, sir? You said that the patient failed a, a collar already. How long, how long after an injury would you still consider an odontoid screw? So, published reports, say up to six months. Um, I only do them the first six weeks, but that's my, I don't know anyone else's personal preference, but after six weeks, it is a little bit more difficult to get past the fracture site. There's already some healing or some fibrous union or non-union that I, I think is difficult to get across. Um, people will do this, they do have, they're very successful with it, but in my practice, it's not something that I do. Yes, sir. Do you use uh we did, we did. Do you ever have problems with using that leg screw, uh, trying to pull that fracture frame back into the direction? Do you take the traction off once they're reduced? Um, if they usually will stay reduced. We usually, I mean, you can reduce them and keep them at maybe five pounds. We don't have to keep them a lot of weight. And we do take the traction off, though, before we put the actual screw in. 
Yes. Is there a reason why you prefer doing a non thin screw in this case versus C1 to apart from preservation of motion? Because I always thought that the morbidity from swallowing issues and stuff is pretty high. In a 70 year old, is motion preservation a big factor? So I would say um, you're correct. A C12 fusion would have also been a very viable option. In our institution, we, we tend to do a lot of odontoid screws in the elderly. Our, our patients tend to do well, although um, this is not in every institution. So this is something I would do. But I think a C12 fusion is also a very good option with less associated morbidity and mortality. I think most people would, would agree that this type of patient really can't leave the hospital in a college. First time around, even if they're refusing or adamant about it, you have really have to make it clear it's because this is already slightly displaced when, when they left the first of x rays. So it's either halo or OR. Um, it's you know, not the appropriate one to put in the collar. Michelle, can you show with the, with the cursor where is the back of the dens? Yeah, it, it, it is. So here here's our the body, and the dens is over here. So the poster. There's C1 and C2 yeah. is back. So that's, that's C1 that's lined up where the dens used to be. That's so C1. That's the dens and the canal. We have lots more fun. All right, transarticular screws. I think uh, Praveen's going to talk about these as well, but that's an option too with somebody with a uh, odontoid fracture. Um, these are not my pictures. I pulled these away from someone else. C12 fusion, which we're going to talk about as well. But C12 fusions have extremely high rates of fusion. They're very good constructs when done correctly and uh, fuse very well. So back to our, uh, our cases. So we have a 70 year old, I have a lot of old people at my institution. So I was supposed to fall off a horse. He fell off a horse, he had some neck pain, his primary care doctor put him in a little collar for a while, his neck pain went away, took it off. So he's seen us uh, six months later. So this is what we have. It's a uh, type two, a dentoid fracture, but now we're six months out. So now, what do we do? Neck pain. And he can't ride his horse. If he rides his horse, he gets this weird sensation. Maybe, probably, I don't remember if it was paresthesias or electrical shocks that kind of run down his body, down his hands. How much is the specimen? It doesn't, it doesn't look like much displacement at all. So don't trade screw at six months. That's um, towards the outer limits of when you would want to do that. It would be very difficult to get across the, you can see these are well corticated, very difficult to get across this fracture and across this uh, fibrous tissue that's in here as well. So he, um, he's symptomatic when he rides his horse. <laughs> Only when he rides his horse. <laughs> this guy's a rancher. We're in Texas. He wants to ride his horse. He's not giving up his horse. So what are we going to do? I don't have my list, so we'll pick um, one of you two. What are you going to do with him? Um... I would flex X him. Okay, so you flex X him. He moves to, two millimeters. Given that he does have a, at least a little bit of motion and he does have symptoms, um, I think that uh, offering him or recommending an operation to him would be where you go. What do you want to do to him? I'd want to take a look at the course of the uh, vertebral artery, but I think uh, a C12 transarticular screw would be reasonable. So C12 fusion of some type. Okay. So that's what we did. I chose a little different option. I did a C1 lateral mass and a C2 pars in this gentleman, and I just supplemented that with a, a wiring in the back. He did well. Six months later, he rode his horses. He actually rode his horses three months later, but in his collar. Um, all right, type three. Yes. Uh, uh, why did you supplement with the Sontag wiring? So um, the people in this room trained me. So I kind of, um, I was trained to do this this way. It works very well. It increases your fusion rate. 
and you, know, you can leave bone graft on the side or in the gutters, but you've already got a, a piece of bone that you can get. It's really easy to, to do a C12 wiring, and it's a nice big solid piece of bone between C1 and C2 that I know is going to fuse, in addition to having the instrumentation there. So type 3. Not much controversy with type 3. 90% of them heal with just simple immobilization. One series had 100% healing rate in a halo and a rigid collar. They're reported anywhere from 50 to 70%. I think it's a little higher than that, but I couldn't find that in the literature. Patient factors also matter, age, medical comorbidities, um, things like that. Again, a, a, this is a type 3 here, but some of these are real shallow. Yes, they go into the body, but a, a shallow type 3, I, I might still consider and treat that as a type 2. If it has more than five millimeters distraction or it cannot be uh, maintained reduction after you reduce these, consider surgery. So I've got another 72 year old. Status post, a, a ground level fall. Again, this is a type three, you can see here. So um, next guy over, how are you gonna treat this? Yeah, that's yeah. So um, I think um, uh, the guy's uh, having neck pain Neck pain only. Um, so I think um, if you look at the extended displacement of the, the C2, um, it's not much. And um, I think um, I would probably try a collar first for this guy, and then uh, have him come back and see how his symptoms are, what the extended fusion is. If it turns out that uh, it still hasn't fused and uh, he's still having symptoms, I'd probably recommend uh, C12 just because of the, the center where I'm at. That's a pretty popular way. So we, we treat him in the cervical collar, we put him in Miami J. Um, he fell again, so we got a CT scan about six weeks or so um, in his collar afterwards. And you can see there's some evidence of healing in this area. And then this is his x-ray, I think three or four months afterwards, and it's completely healed. I couldn't find the CT, but he healed very well on a collar. So this is a 34-year-old, status post in MVC. Again, we've got a, a type three. So um, next guy over, what are we gonna do with our 34 year old with a type three odontoid fracture? So you're gonna put him in a halo or a collar? Collar. Okay, it's so like a Miami J collar. So we did that, we put him in a collar, but he's 34 and he's invincible and twice I walked into his room and he wasn't wearing his collar. So now what are you going to do? Uh, well, two, two days. I mean, he's in the hospital. Oh, two days. days Each day I walked in not wearing his collar. Well, I did a... You see, surgery is an option. Or I call it the, the, the penalty halo. So... Um, <laughs> I put him in a halo, and because, I, I mean, he's young, he wasn't a smoker, he could heal well with the mobilization as long as he kept his immobilization on, so I put him in a halo, um, secondary to non-compliance, and in a halo, um, four weeks later, he came back with an x-ray, which looked alarming, and uh, obviously he's got a trach, so he really isn't doing a lot of things going on, but th this is what it looked like, so now what are we going to do? Next guy over. We, yeah. we have one patient somewhere store that came back to the ED with the, the, halo, the penalty halo in his hand. <laughs> We've seen that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they can take him off if they want to. So, they, I'm sorry, was he symptomatic? Was he symptomatic? Um, no, he, I mean, he wasn't symptomatic. Well, um, you know, despite the fact that he's not symptomatic, he's obviously not stable and he's obviously not, not compliant as well. He's still conservative management. And, um, you know, he's, as you said, very poor. And I said, well, this is going to get worse. So I would consider surgery. Um, what do you see? One, well, uh, depends on what you're comfortable with. But I'll uh, have fusion as well. C12 fusion? Yeah. Are you going to reduce that somehow? Yeah, I'll try to reduce. So I would, um, you know, again, put the halo ring back on, try to reduce them in the lab under the halo. So we, uh, we, we reduced them in the, I think it is ICU bed, um, or in the hospital. So we reduced them, we got another CT, and it reduces really well. And then we did exactly what you suggested, and we went and did a C12 fusion. And it, it, 
unreduced a millimeter or two, but it, it healed very well. Can I just ask, um, so can you go back to that sure. slide? Sure. Uh, so what are, what are your operative, um, how, how do you uh, decide when you have a high riding bird as you do there, what, what size screen you put in, or, or does that affect your, whether you do a harm versus transarticular screw? So, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the transarticular screw. Um, so it's, I, I do a C12 fusion, either with a C2 pedicle or a C2 par screw. And it uh, depends where the vert is. And I actually measure, I mean, I teach all the residents to measure how far you can go, how far you can drill, and um, so you know exactly where you're going. And when you put in the C2 par screws, and we'll show you tomorrow or the next day, whenever the, the lab is, it's real easy. You, you can see your pars. I mean, you can literally take your pen fill floor, see the lateral and the medial border, and you, you just go right down the hole. All right, so recommendations. In 2013, there's a supplement that was put out for um, spine injuries. There are level two and level three data. Recommendations, hopefully you can read this. The Dondra fracture type one, collar mobilization, which we talked about. Type two, uh, they recommend early surgery if you're greater than 50 years old, or halo if you're less than 50. Type two A or two C, early surgery, which is our common needed fractures. Type three, collar or halo or surgery if it doesn't, if it's a big angulation or if it doesn't reduce. What I kind of recommend for type one, again, is a collar. Type two, um, usually collar or surgery. Um, we have the penalty halo, which we will use, um, or sometimes patients don't want to have surgery, and if it needs to be reduced and it won't stay that way in a collar, we'll put a halo on. We do leave that up to the patients. Uh, consider, you know, surgery if they're greater than 50 years old, a type 2A fracture, if there's a big displacement of five or six millimeters, they can't maintain alignment, or if the patient wishes to rather have an odontroid screw or some kind of effusion rather than wear a collar or a halo. And type 3, um, Again, it recommends collar or halo, but we usually try a collar first, um, unless they're not compliant or we do a penalty halo. And that's it.